Hello everybody, my name is Thomas. I would like to give a video lecture on the phenomenon of urbanism and I called it the short history of urbanism, a short one because uh, the history of cities is um, uh, much greater than what I will be able to provide here. Um, I can um, refer to ancient cities or medieval cities but um, on modern cities, because um, if we're dealing with the phenomenon of urbanism, of the urban society and the urban condition, we have to deal with the modern city, because this is a modern phenomenon. So I would like to start with a brief introduction what happened uh, to the cities in the 19th century, and then I would like to deliver to you three theories prominent scholar, by prominent scholars uh, on, on the subject, um, Louis Wilf, um, Richard Sennett and uh, Richard uh, Florida, who shed light on, on the aspect of the urban condition from very different um, vantage points. But um, I think it's quite fascinating to compare these and to have them for a discussion um, for our cause. So, um, as I said, um, we're dealing with cities, with sustainable cities, moreover, um, we're dealing with the urban condition and urban phenomenon. But what is urban? And what is a city? And uh, to us, um, it seems simple to give an answer uh, what a city is. But uh, in fact, um, if you're dealing with theory and if you try to conceptualize it adequately, it's not that easy to define and explain what a city is. So let's have a short look in history. If we talk about cities, what we think of cities nowadays, we think of the city of the 19th century, the consequences of the capitalist cities, of the transformation of medieval cities into modern cities by industrialization. And in the 19th century, um, the whole image, the face, the look, and uh, the mode of uh, society which uh, was possible and took place in cities changed rapidly, significantly and even in a very revolutionary way because uh, old cities, the Alte Stadt, uh, the old city, the medieval one, the Renaissance one was wiped out by capitalism and by mass, mass production. Um, Henri Lefebvre, great scholar, on urbanism too, called it the implosion and explosion of the cities. First, the medieval cities imploded, the Baroque city, the Renaissance city, they crumbled, if you like, and um, only the facades and the, some museums for sculptures and the like um, survived. And then the new city, the capitalist city, exploded. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people poured in the cities to work in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the industry and to get to become uh, workers and what Marx called later the working class. And so they need housing, they need uh, groceries, they need uh, later they need uh, subways and bus systems and so on and so forth. And the first um, theorist or the first concept of um, urbanism I would like to um, introduce to you is was delivered by Louis Wirth in 1938 and he was a scholar of Simmel or a follower of Simmel's ideas and he uh, mm, uh, brought in some aspects which are still relevant today to analyze cities that is in his words that a city that we have can talk of a um, Urban, of an urban agglomeration, if the agglomer agglomeration has a certain size, a certain density, and a certain heterogeneity. First of all, size simply means a certain amount of people and a certain you know, uh, agglomeration, a certain form of agglomeration. Um, so you can't have an urban condition, urban living, um, in a small town, you know, in a small village or on the countryside then you need a certain form of density and normally the size produces also a certain form of density 
And density, and that's fascinating what, what Wilf uh, says, produces or has social effects. It's not only that you're sitting side by side next, well, you know, door by door, and go on each other's nerves too, and that's an effect. But what he stresses is that this density, and he's very near to Simmel, produces distance, social distance, as a prerequisite to act urban. That's very uh, different to the countryside, where you know each other and you have to know each other, otherwise you might be called arrogant or whatever. Um, so in the city you have to be arrogant, or blasiert, blasiert uh, Simmel called it, a certain form of arrogance, um, to um, save your individuality. And this ref leads to um, a certain form of reflection and rationality. That's a very important point in this because you have to reflect yourself in the light of the others. You know, because you are mirrored by, your aspirations are mirrored by other people with their aspirations. It's always contested, the lifestyles and so on. And so you begin to reflect and you begin to develop a rational um, attitude towards the world. So for this early sociologist, the, this modern city was also, um, if you like, the, uh, um, the birth of the modern rational man. This leads to heter heterogeneity, his last, his last aspect. So to grasp the quality of the city, if it's urban or not, you have especially a, a look uh, if you can find a certain form of social diversification, social heterogeneity. And this leads, for instance, as a last point, to be able to judge a city which is highly segregated, let's say by class or race, you know, black people, white people, poor people, rich people, and so on, is not urban in the sense uh, with um, conceptualize it because you don't mix up to a certain amount that you your character gets urban. You stay in your enclaves, in the rich enclaves, in the white enclaves, and so on. This was about 1938, late 30s, and uh, there had been a lot of uh, discussions on, on the effects of uh, suburbanization and city growth in the 50s and 60s and 70s, of course, too. I can't really relate uh, to that here, but um, during the 1980s and 90s, uh, another great scholar, Richard Sennett, provided a theory or a social history of the city, which he named Flash and Stone. Um, he provided, let's say, an alternative theory or view on the urban history. And he starts in, with the ancient city. He does it. He starts with the Greek city and going through Roman cities, medieval cities, and New York, Greenwich Village. Uh, he ends uh, with, in his, um, with his analysis. And his main point is that the modern city, the modern urbanism, provides a certain bodily alienation of the people. You may experience it a little bit like that. So it's very urban, it's very global, it's cosmopolitan and the like, but it's very abstract. And you behave like that in the city. You have uh, intentions, you go for that and for that, for shopping, for museums and the like, but you don't um, hesitate, you don't you know, spend time in the city and just you know, for leisure or the like. Otherwise you would be judged maybe as a problematic person. You get a problem because your body does not behave properly for this modern kind of city, you know, rushing from here to there. And his examples are quite fascinating because he draws a lot on the American condition where you have uh, huge suburban agglomerations and where you go by car, so you're deprived of a century, central uh, experience of the cities, of the ways, of the pathways and, and so on. And so you just stop by and go to the cinema in New York suburb, for instance, that's his example. And um, 
In that uh, New York suburb, he, uh, he, uh, it came to his mind that there is, uh, watching a movie with his friend, that there is a certain problem connected with this lifestyle. A problem the Greeks and the Romans hadn't had, because they had a certain sense for the body, for the bodily experiences, and to have, experience a certain form of leisure um, when you're in the city. And um, he uh, criticizes that, among a lot of other things too, and he criticizes it, and that's very interesting, uh, also in contemporary New York, in Greenwich Village, uh, where he lives. And so his main point is that this modernism, um, a capitalist modernization of the cities, which is still preeminent, of course, uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, um, is shaping um, our bodies, if you like. It makes our bodies, he draws a lot on Michel Foucault, it makes our bodies function in a certain way and behave to others in a certain way, in a very distantiated way. And then, let's say about 10 years after Richard Sand, um, Richard Florida um, published a book which he called The Rise of the Creative Class. And um, it's heavily discussed. It's maybe the most discussed uh, publication on urban phenomena in the last decade. Cities nowadays, after the urban revolution of the 19th and 20th century, and after the suburban condition when the, when the people fled the city, to the suburbs. The city got attractive again for a lot of people who like to live in the innermost city, in the most urban condition they can have. And he called these people creative class. And this sparked a uh, huge discussion and a lot of young people, young people like you, students, web designers, musicians, artists, architects, the creative class wants to live in the cities again because they need these uh, inspiring uh, environments for their job and for their lifestyles. He said if a city is likely to be successful nowadays after the urban revolution, after the industrial revolution and um, in the post-Fordist era, he called it, in the era after Fordism, um, if the city wants to be successful, it has to become attractive for the creative class. It has to provide sites, architecture, culture, a certain urban condition, a certain urban image of its own, of its own city and its city history, to be interested for people like the creative class. And this brings me to the last point. Um, what Florida says and what would be the consequence of that. If you behave like the creative class, if you like to live in the cities again, if you like to work in the innermost city cores again, if you like to spend time there, uh, in the bistros, in the cafes, in the restaurants, in the offices, the creative offices, negotiating projects, meeting business partners and, and so on. If you if, it, if this is given as a as new phenomenon, is it the solution of the problem which Sennett raised? Because these people, these people, bring in their body again. They spend time in the city, leisure time. They um, like don't like to function in a Fordist way, like a typical commuter of the fifties or sixties. You know getting in the city in the morning and getting out of it in the evening. They like to spend time there. They like to live the urban condition. They like to bring their body in. Um, so that um, would be my last point. Maybe it's uh, a starting point for your discussion um, that the consequence of the creative class, is it the solution of what uh, Senna described or is, are there still some problems um, connect, connected to this new development? So, that's it. Thanks for watching.